styles. Can I ask you something? Do you really like working on Kane stuff? You really like busting people? Yeah. I bust frauds, I bust furries. I love it. Have you ever busted anyone you know? Yeah, I tried it. That makes no difference. See, in my business, you soon find out that everybody's capable of it. Think of it, they've done it. Yeah, but the thing of the upside is it doesn't leave you too much to be disappointed in either.
Yo, what's up? All right, y'all, let's go. What's going on? Sorry for the extra long introduction there. I've got like all these things uh, going on. The lights are flickering because of the storm, I guess, on the way. Big old southern storm on the way. So if the lights flicker and they go out, it's just a, it's just a big old southern storm. All right, we're going to get back to it. I'm sure it'll be all right. Uh, but they're flickering. Like the lamp over there was flickering on and off. It was very, very strange. It was flickering like a, like a, like a, like a, I'm trying to think of a norm joke. Like a, like a, a, a vampire's demeanor, says norm. Um, yeah, but I don't know what was going on. And then I had an update and then the speakers didn't work. Anyway, you don't want to know about all that. So tonight, uh, tonight we've got a, after Dark stream on a good movie, y'all. Have y'all seen this classic movie? This is the 1998 movie uh, Ronin with Robert De Niro. And it's, I think it's an excellent movie. Um, I would say it's underrated, but I don't think it is. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, it's discussed and uh, talked about, you know, often, I guess, at least by the fellas. I know that um, my uh, my friends and I love talking about this movie because, it's a classic. It's a classic political thriller slash uh, European, um, you know, sort of intelligence slash mercenary movie. Um, it's got a bunch of different elements in it. it. First of all, it's all set in Europe. It's set in France, and they go from you know city to city, Paris, Nice, etc. Um, it's John Frankenheimer. It's got, I think, the best car chase scenes in film, and uh, that is. I remember reading that when the film first came out. Um, I saw it at the Bird Theater in Richmond, Virginia with my friend Spencer. Shouts out to Spencer. Uh, and uh, it, it was one of those movies that came out, and it was like, you know, Robert De Niro, he's got a leather jacket, there's a gun on the poster, and we knew it was something about, you know, Hitman or something. So we, you know, we went to the movies and we saw it. And, uh, you know, it was one of those um, sleeper hits. It was like, oh, my gosh, like five minutes into the movie, and it's, you know, it's captivating. So it has a lot of really cool elements, um, and I think it does it does this genre pretty well. And one thing that it does is actually it sort of breaks genres. It starts off as one thing, and then it kind of morphs into something else, and then it becomes something else entirely. So, you know, this isn't a review, um, so I'm going to talk about the ending, right? Shouts out to my friend Rollin out there. He's got, what does he say, two-hour-long car ride. Oh, two-hour-long uh, car chase. Yeah, the car chase scenes are amazing. I, I remember, you know, they like to compare movies like this to, like, Bullet and things like that. Now there have been a bunch of movies made since this um, that have great car chase scenes. A lot of people like the Baby Driver movie, but I don't like that movie only because it has the word drive in it, and I like the movie Drive, um, of course. Uh, so, and that that movie does some of the same sort of tactics in terms of the car chase scenes that this movie does. And um, the first time I saw this, uh, I thought it was interesting that the chase scenes don't take place like they usually do in film. And one example of that is how they, um, they stop, they come to a complete stop and pull over. And, you know, I'm sure that had been done in film before this. I can't think of any examples, but uh, drive actually did a great example of that, obviously. So it's not just a gearhead movie, but I know that gearheads love this movie. It's got great examples of 90s uh, Audis in it. There's a brown Audi parked out front. Have a towed immediately. Chop, chop. Yes, sir, Judge. Um, and uh, what movie is that? We've already got Jason, who got knighted tonight uh, by winning the trivia, the obscure um, Robert De Niro trivia quote. It's not really that obscure. If you like, if you watch De Niro gangster movies, you know what that is. What this blueberry doesn't have enough muffins. I, they don't have the same number of blueberries. He gets up, he goes to the back. What I want an equal number of blueberries in each muffin. Are you serious? That would take forever. I don't care how long it takes. That's a terrible De Niro impression. It's going to get better as this goes on because De Niro has some memorable uh, quotes in this movie. So. All right, so shouts out to everybody out there. I hope this is um, going to be a chill, relaxing, uh, after dark Saturday night stream. I know everybody's out there uh, at their Saturday night parties. Somebody's parents went out for the night, so everybody's going over there before the cops come, right? 
Um, somebody brought the Mad Dog 2020. Somebody brought the, uh, the terrible uh, Barry Cisco. Spencer brought that. Um, somebody brought the Beast Light. Now that we're grown, people were sitting here on a Saturday night talking about movies, but that's cool because um, I love movies, and this is uh, this is a particularly good one. And actually, this one plays into a lot of the things that we discuss because number one, um, I found this excellent book. It really is great, and it's called The Prone Gunman, and it's by uh, Jean Patrick Manchette. And this was a French uh, crime noir writer who died uh, in his fifties. He was a uh, Kind of a left, you know, as he it says in the introduction and in his biographies, he was a left leaning French writer. Well, that's, you know, kind of the status quo, especially after uh, 1968 and all that stuff. Um, and then he, he writes about things related to Gladio, Red Brigades, et cetera. But this is a great book that I just kind of kind of stumbled upon. And it wasn't until I was well into the book that I realized that it's the basis for the Sean Penn, CIA Sean Penn movie, uh, The Gunman. Uh, if you guys saw that, that mo- I'm going to discuss that movie sort of at the end. And it's in the same sort of universe as Ronan, obviously, because it involves uh, soldiers of fortune, mercenaries, and uh, international assassinations, NGOs, etc. And actually, the movie was a bomb, which, um, you know, is, I guess, not unexpected. I mean, um, in light of the uh, the other movies that come out, you know, like right now, for instance, you know, did you know that the Wes Anderson movie is out right now? Actually, Jethro, shouts out to Jethro because he clued me into that because he uh, showed me that uh, Harrison Smith had uh, recommended that movie, the new Wes Anderson movie. Of course, we've analyzed Wes Anderson here. Um, but one thing that I realized about that, just as a short tangent here, is that I think it's interesting that we have uh, Barbieheimer, right? And there is a strange correlation between those two movies. There just is because you know Barbie exists in the exists in the fifties uh, post nuke um, era, and also remember the the uh, film of the nuclear tests, which include um, the footage of like the plastic, you know, the fake house, right? Which has like baby dolls in it. It's got like a children's room, doesn't it? Or am I just, is that uh, some sort of Mandela effect that I'm imagining? Um, not that I, Mandela effect what, is is whatever, but um, I think I remember that correctly. Uh, also, I was just talking um, with my friend Rollin there, and we were talking movies, and he brought up Indiana Jones and um, the, the uh, Crystal Skull movie. And one thing I do like about that movie is that it begins with the nuke test, right? And he's like in the town. And, uh, you know, of course he like hides in the lead lined good old American fridge so that he doesn't get uh nuclear radiated or whatever. I like that scene. I think that's um, kind of cool, kind of clever. And, um, I actually didn't hate that movie. I don't like that. It involves the, the, the watchers and the, the, uh, ancient alien astronauts or whatever. I think that's lame, but, um, you know, Shia LaBeouf, uh, I'm a Shia LaBeouf enjoyer because, you know, he's so hated on that I kind of think, you know, the opposite. I think, all right, you know, let's give this guy a chance. Um, anyway, where was I going with that? Oh, the Wes Anderson film. Um, it's strange because it's obviously, it's, what's it called? Asteroid City or something like that? So the movie is about um, uh, Brenda Densler and... Uh, and uh, inside the Pentagon's brain, no, it's about the, I guess, uh, the 50s. And it looks like Los Alamos. It looks like New Mexico. And I don't know anything else about the movie. But I do think it's interesting that the aesthetic, just in the poster alone, um, reminds me of the brightness of 50s Barbie, of uh, the vivid colors, right? And that's Chuck juxtaposed against, first of all, the alien thing, but also uh, rockets and weapons of war, which is obviously um, Oppenheimer. Now, that's not a rocket, I know, but um, but the rockets were being, uh, were being sent from, uh, um, from Germany, of course, over to, uh, to England, the V1 and the V2. So that supposedly is the impetus for why we, you know, started developing the nuke. But anyway, uh, last thing I'll say about that is that I tried to shout out to my sister out there because um, she uh, 
She uh, is uh, very, she supports the channel. And uh, she said, go on and see Barbie Hammer. Go on and see, um, go on and see that uh, Sloppenheimer movie. Um, even though there's a, apparently like a 30 minute long scene with the, uh, the, the weird girl from Midsommar, right? Giving a, excuse my language, but a Sloppenheimer or something like that in the movie. Ugh. Um, is that a thing? Did anybody hear see Oppenheimer yet? So, um, but I tried to go see it and literally every seat, every showing, every theater was sold out. Like I checked eight different theaters, every showtime, every seat was sold out for Oppenheimer. I thought that was, uh, I mean, ahead of time, that's unusual. Um, I guess maybe one thing is that the cinemas are finally fully catching up to, uh, you know, the Karanka, right? The shutdowns. I think the last movie I saw in the uh, theater was Possessor, maybe? When uh, my friend Paul rented out the theater, we went and saw Possessor, which I covered here. I analyzed that film. I think that was, no, actually it was Tenet. I can't believe it's been three years since Tenet came out. What in the world? Okay, anyway, so um, so let's talk about Ronin. Enough babbling. Um, Ronin is, again, it's a John Frankenheimer, 1998, um, crime noir, CIA, mercenary, uh, European movie. And immediately, so what, so here's my DVD copy. I have two copies of this. I've seen this movie like um, 33 million times, you guys. And I'm sure the other dudes in the audience, at least, you guys have probably seen this movie a lot. You've either seen it a lot or you've never seen it. I recommend this movie. It's good. Um, first, we uh, see the the uh, epigraph to the movie, which is a, uh, it, it's talking about the Ronin and the font reflects the the Japanese um, characters talking about the uh, sort of mentioning the forty seven Ronin. Of course, that movie with with uh, Kinko Reeves came out later. Um, and you know, just defining what Ronin means, of course, masterless samurai. Now, when the movie came out, I don't think a whole lot of people in the culture, uh, had, you know, used that word often or knew what it meant. I certainly didn't. I was like 17 or 18 when the movie came out. Um, but it introduced me to a whole world of, of things, uh, a whole, a whole universe. And this movie's great because it's consistent in terms of its exposition and its backstory. So we are, we're told that Ronan means masterless samurai. And of course, then we cut to um, Robert De Niro and he is uh, walking down some uh, rainy steps in, obviously in France. And there's a little, you know, a little, a little bar on the, a little French bar on the corner. And we see some, you know, kind of shady characters walk into it. Now, of course, the, the cool thing, one of the things I like about this movie is, um, the the like aesthetic of the movie the, the costumes the the way that it looks it's like it's contemporary it's 90s it could be today um the the bad guys who are good guys bad guys we don't know yet but they are you know they're probably assassins guns for hire um they have obviously they're going to have a special set of skills um they all just look pretty drab and normal you know they're not supposed to stand out they're supposed to be you know the gray man um De Niro has on just like a, a a Macintosh, right? A little Macintosh and kind of a one, you know, an Irish flat cap. And he's just kind of walking down the stairs, but we can see that his eyes are shiftily looking around and he's obviously checking out his, you know, he's aware of his surroundings. And so we become aware that he's walking into something and he has to be extremely cautious because we don't know this meeting that he's walking into, even though everybody in the bar looks like they just look totally normal. There is um, a lady who goes in. She's Natasha McElhone. She's, uh, is she English? I think she's English, but she, I like her in this movie because she does, uh, first of all, she does a good um, Northern Irish accent. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Um, Jonathan Price, on the other hand, um, it, it, you know, I don't often like criticize people's accents in movie, I th uh, movies. I think that's kind of lame. Um, but, Honestly, like it's it's off putting. Um, he's clearly he's clearly an Englishman from uh, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and the Pirates of the Penzance, uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean Penzance movies, um, playing an officer and now kind of like LARPing as a as an, you know, uh, IRA dissident. 
And it's it's kind of it's kind of off putting. But anyway, he's not in the movie yet, but she is, and she goes behind the bar. She's like pouring a drink. Um, De Niro finally walks in, and uh, you know he, they say we're closed, and he says, um, you know, just un petit, un petit. He wants a little glass of French wine, and this is supposed to make you think that this is a signal or a code, right? That he that the people are supposed to walk in at closing time and say a phrase to let the other people know that they're there for this reason. Um, so the guy says, yeah, I'll get you that. And then he says, uh, he says, you know, where's the bathroom or whatever? A toilet. And the guy says, ah, it's in the back. So De Niro walks back there, uh, unlocks the door, um, and then uh, looks at the guy. The guy's looking at him, and then he says, oh, you know, and then he, then he goes into the actual bathroom. Now, before that, before he walked in, um, he moved some crates around, and he took his gun, and he uh, stashed the burner in the bushes. He put his gun, you know, behind these crates. And we know, even as an uninformed audience, you know, that he's doing this because he, um, he's a professional, right? Uh, he goes into the place. Um, and then he meets the girl. They, uh, the regular people, the normies or whatever, like, they empty out of the place. And then they all um, are supposed to get in a black van, and they're going to go to their next site. Now, in the meantime... Uh, the lady says, what were you doing back there? What are you doing back there? Man, what were you doing back there? Fuck's sake. You were back there with your gun, so you were. No, she doesn't say it like that. She's much more, so she's much softer. But, you know, she was aware of what he was doing back there, even though he was hardly making any noise. And he says, lady, I don't walk into a place if I feel the heat around the corner. And 30 seconds flat, right? Uh, we've done heat and heat too, by the way. So in other words, uh, she says, are you scared? And he says, of course I'm scared. Yeah, I never, you know, what do we want me to walk into a place and there's, I don't know who's going to be in there. I put my gun back here. I don't know if they're going to search me. So he puts his gun back there and he had, he had unlocked the door so that if he needs to, he can make an exit, right? Which is like standard, you know, standard uh, uh, situational awareness, I guess. I guess, but they get in the black van and then they go to this, you know, warehouse, of course. And, uh, you know, Ulster well, IRA woman is the, she's the, she's not the handler. She's uh, running the op, right? We don't know what the op is yet, but we're introduced to this cast of characters. And this is great because this is a great example of show versus tell, even in film, because um, we're questioning to ourselves, who are these people? What's their story? And we aren't told that in a cheap way by the other characters, right? Oh, I come from the army and I'm over here because it's like we get to know them gradually and that sort of reflects not only real life, but it's true to the story because these people are, you know, they exist in an underworld that we um, are not, we're not privy to. So even when they're amongst themselves, they know to what to say, what not to say, what kind of questions to ask. We're introduced to uh, Sean Bean, of course, we're seeing Bean and... Um, this is cool because what is the deal with Sean Bean, y'all? Like, what's the deal? Because, like, he he's he has a thing. He's like a cool-looking dude, right? Like, he is cool-looking. There's something about him that's like, okay, this guy's pretty cool. And I think part of that is uh, from Patriot Games, at least. You know, he was um, he was a pretty cool character in that, right? Um, which is interesting because the girl in this is obviously IRA connected. Then we're going to meet Jonathan Price and we're going to learn that he's IRA connected. Sean Bean played an IRA dissident in Patriot Games. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, I guess that's it. But Michael Lonsdale will also show up later in the movie, right? Hugo Drax. Um, Jean Reno is in this movie and he is like super cool. He's really... you. He's the good guy, and you know that right away because what I've said before about the eyes, right? He's got kind eyes, and he even said, you know, he offers De Niro a cigarette the next morning. He offers him a, a well, how do you say it? A gal, a galois, a gal. Let's look it up. How do you say that French cigarette? Somebody put the phonetic um, pronunciation. A gal, galois, galois cigarette. It's like the French cigarette. Let's look it up. I can't believe I'm just now looking this up. Um, Galois, I said. Galois. Say it again. 
Oh, girl. Gulwaz. 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 My friend Maddie, who knows uh, languages, says uh, Galwa, Galwa, Ziz, Galwa, Ziz. Wahoo, wah. That's what I just read. Wahoo, wah. Go, who's UVA? Um, is literally what my friends would say right now. Um, uh, Gulwa. I guess it's got the word Gaul in it because Gaul, because it's France. Um, I got some of those when I was in France. And anyway, so Jean Reno offers uh, De Niro a uh, Galois a cigarette, a little cigarette, right when he wakes up the next morning. And uh, it's pretty cool because it looks like it's a pretty satisfying cigarette. Um, De Niro has slept in a sleeping bag in his clothes uh, because they're in the warehouse and they got to, you know, get ready for the next day. Um, Sean Bean was, of course, on watch, even though they don't know each other yet, but he was on watch. Uh, we learned that uh, Jean Reno is the... Uh, he is the tour guide, he says. I'm the tour. Well, well, if he's in Paris, I will get it. He can get them a car. He can get them weapons. He can get them cigarettes. He can get them medical stuff. He can get them, uh, 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 um, you know, a gunfire simulator, right? This guy, is, he's the guy. But he kind of takes a liking to De Niro. And uh, later on, he's going to say, if I wanted to shoot you, what, how would it benefit me? The money? I've already got the money. I've already got the money. Remember Jean Reno's role as... Leon, the professional, he's already played an assassin in a movie. And he was, I'm sure he got his part in this movie because he was in Mission Impossible, right? With Tom Coombe in 1996. He's the guy who's like hoisting the wires when Tom Coombe, right, is trying to break into the CIA facility, which weirdly, like, you have to rappel down and all that stuff. Um, Oh, in the movie, but like, okay, anyway. So Jean Reno is the Frenchman in the movie, right? Um, so yeah, they uh, what you say, um, the important. What do the French know about tobacco? Well, uh, Philip Morris actually, re- for Philip Morris, which is um, headquartered here in my hometown, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Philip Mor- Morris. This is Marlboro country right here, and in fact. Um, when I was growing up, the guy who lived, uh, I think, three doors down worked in advertising, and he's the guy who invented the Marlboro Man, which is like the most successful advertising thing of all time, um, which is pretty cool. Of course, that's not, you know, that's not, you can't talk about that now. I guess they got rid of him. Um, but French do know about cigarettes. They actually, um, the European Marlboro is headquartered in France. Um, I think there's one in Switzerland. Marlboro, of course, broke off into, um, uh, what's the name of the company? Uh, Ultria. It's a different company, and that happened after the hearings and all that stuff when, you know, they were talking about the, they had to change the cigarettes. They can't say Marlboro Lights anymore. So stupid. Uh, If you go to, like, if you go to Asia, if you go to, like, Thailand, don't go to Thailand. But if you go to Thailand and you buy cigarettes, like, they've got the pictures of, like, the carcasses and the like black lung on the on all the cigarettes to try to deter you from cigarettes. It doesn't work, by the way. Uh, but anyway, so um, what was I saying? Uh, okay, so yeah, he offers him a cigarette, and uh, then we have our first meeting. You know, amongst this this group of um, daring do misfits, I guess. There's also a guy who he's pretty cool. He's obviously the the driver. Um, he's kind of a pudgier guy, but he's got like a pretty cool look to him. Actually, he's an American. Um, and then of course we've got uh, the wild card, which is Stellan Skarsgård. Um, who shouts out to our friend Jethro right there because Jeff um, loves Stellan Skarsgård. I love uh, this dude also. He's he's uh, pretty versatile, and um, he's been in a ton of movies, which is. Funny because he kind of inherited Max von Sydow's, I guess, Swedish thing of being in like a bazillion movies. Uh, recently, we talked about him, I guess last week when we were talking about uh, Dune and how he plays the uh, Judge Holden slash Colonel Kurtz, Marlon Brando, uh, floating bald, you know, bulbous, black goo bathing uh, bad guy. How's that for alliteration? That was pretty good. That was pretty good. That was pretty impressive. That just uh, burst off the tongue right there. So anyway, um, Stellan Skarsgård, who is dressed in a, a, like a three-piece suit. He's got glasses. And, you know, he's obviously like the computer guy. He's the tech guy. But 
He's also, he's not like nerdy like he they usually are. Like, you remember the guy in Die Hard, uh, the tech guy? You bam, we got it. You know, that guy, glasses, uh, nerdy, gets knocked out easily. And he breaks the mold because uh, in the latter part of this scene, De Niro will sort of uh, 4D chess move set him up to test him. He's going to put a coffee cup, like a metal coffee cup, near the edge of the table. He pours his coffee, but he spills it purposefully. And then he like acts like he's clumsy, and he kind of bumps into the table, and the cup drops. Stellan Skarsgård is sitting there, and he catches the cup. And De Niro says, the reflexes. Yeah, they die hard. That's what he says. And they die hard, huh? So, um, obviously, Skarsgård is uh, more than what he appears to be. We assume he's probably former, you know, East German Stasi or KGB, it's something Eastern European, um, some sort of special ex special forces assassin, something. But he's a trained guy, and he can handle himself. Um, so that's that's kind of the wild card. So um, what happens is they learn that the operation for which they'll get, uh, I guess, twenty thousand American dollars up front. And then um, when it's complete, they'll get another 20 grand. Nice little payday. Um, involves them ambushing, like, uh, they're going to do a, a weapons deal, like a swap. And then they're going to ambush this dude. And then they got to, like, get a case. Okay. So the case is the proverbial MacGuffin in this film. And it's, like, probably the best example of a MacGuffin besides um, Hitchcock or Pulp Fiction. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a metal briefcase that's handcuffed to the principal's wrist, and they got they have to somehow get this thing. And De Niro's like, "What's in the case? You don't need to know. You don't need to know what's in the case. You're just gonna get the case." De Niro says, "Is it heavy? Is it light? Is it explosive? Is it uh, what's in it? We need to know what if." We're going to need a hundred grand up front. We're going to need another hundred grand. That goes for everybody, right? Uh, he wants to know the details. So basically the handler lady says, um, no, we're going we're gonna to ambush these people. We don't really have a plan. We're going to kind of wing it. That's obviously not uh, what these dudes are used to or what they want. But um, uh, there's a, they make a point of showing Sean Bean, uh, seeing Bean talk to De Niro and say, I'm a wet, he says, oh, I'm a weapons, I'm a weapons guy. What kind of weapons do you like? What, what, what you usually use? And De Niro says, I don't know. It's just a tool, whatever, whatever's in the, whatever's in the tool bag, whatever's in the, in the tool case, you know, is one thing's as good as another, right? In other words, I'm not giving you details. What kind of, what kind of, you know, what kind of questions they've been asking me? And he says in Goodfellas, which is the same here. It's a weird question in this situation. What kind of gun do you like to use? I, I imagine that the the tone of this scene makes that seem um, uh, not, it doesn't fit in. And that actually, um, they're vindicated in their, uh, in, you know, they don't trust Sean Bean. And they, this, they're, later they're right about this. By the way, um, forgot to mention that the script in this is like weirdly tight and good. It's, it's very well written. It's succinct. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just very like, it's a tight script. And that is because it's a David Mamet movie. Did you know that, that the screenplay was written by David Mamet under a pseudonym? Uh, one of his like many pseudonyms, I guess. But once you, once you realize that, then you're like, Oh, now I get it. It's clearly a mammoth script, right? Um, because of the sort of punchy dialogue, the sort of uh, unexpected twists in terms of their brief conversations. Um, you know, in a way, it's like he took Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and he like just like chopped it down to one word sentences because that fits the the content here, right? So, um, yeah, yes, it's a tight. You know what I mean by a tight script? Is that to uh, isn't that too wanky of a, a term? Um, listen, listen, we're, we're in the writer's room, all right? I need a tight script. I need it to be tight. Tight like a tiger. All right? I need it tight like a tiger. No leaks in this script. I need it tight. Every word has to punch. It's got a bounce. It's got a hit. 
And that character partly comes um, from I happened to see somebody on the uh, in the writer strike today um, who made a, a video, I guess, for you know shorts or for YouTube or whatever. And it maybe it's just this particular guy, but it it really annoyed me um, because uh, <laughs> it just showed you, and it's is not for everybody, obviously, but. It just showed you how out of touch some people are. He said, um, listen, I was I wrote for um ten of the most successful shows ever produced. Okay. Right out of the you know, right when I got there, I started writing for um these shows. I went from one hit to another and I was making tons of money. But then when they changed it and they went to Netflix, uh now, you know, I only get like I only work three days a week, you know, and I can't just live on four grand a week, right? I got it, I'm supposed to be working. Um, so that's why we're doing this. And I thought, like, dude, do not let this guy be the the mouthpiece for this thing. Right? Four grand a week. <laughs> well, I guess, you know, I guess whatever industry you're in, you know, you're paid um uh commensurate with your experience and you know, whatever it is. So that's not bad. But I mean, one hit after another. I wrote for 10 hit shows. You know, I'm glad. I'm, you know, I'm happy for that dude. I'm glad he um, had success. I don't even know who it was or what, what the shows were, but I believe that I'm sure he did that. And that's great. But, uh, damn dude. I mean, some people can't even get the McD's uh, McDouble with the, with the McGrimmis shake, right? They got to save up for that right now. I mean, seriously, like milk is unbelievable. My, I don't know what the gas is where you guys live, but you know, it's like three sixty-five here. I paid eight bucks for two small Red Bulls the other day at the shop. What? So it what the price like tripled? Anyway, okay. Sorry, sorry. I'm um, sorry to complain, but like that's that's on that's ridiculous. So, um. I'll try to remain focused with the rest of this uh, analysis. So what happens is basically um, they, uh, they go into the operation. Uh, they've got their, their car now, you know, the guys for an Audi with, uh, with uh, nitrous and all this, and they've got their weapons and they pull up and they, basically it's nighttime. It's right by the Seine in um, Paris and another car pulls up. Of course, the bad guys um, are going to be, they look like they're, you know, uh, but probably Algerian or something, you know, um, because of the French history with Algeria and the Pied Noir and the, the Foreign Legion. These guys are uh, so, some sort of other thing, and there's going to be a handoff, right? So they've got the money, and um, they got to trade the weapons. We don't really see the weapons, but we know there's money involved in whatever. And they say, okay, here you go. And, you know, it's in the trunk, and Sean Bean counts the money. It's, it's not all there. It's not all there. Where's the rest? He said, he's down there. He's down there. Yeah. You just go down there. He said, down there. And De Niro says, I'm not going in there. Well, you want me to go in there? I'm not going in there. What are you scared? Oh, you don't want to lose. They say, you don't want to lose your skin or something like that. And he says, uh, yeah, I like my skin. It covers my body. Well, I'm not going in there. I don't have a good feeling. Right. He said, he has a good maxim at one point. He says, uh, what what I learned? Where there is doubt, there is no doubt. In other words, don't go into that, don't go into that tunnel. But Sean Bean is freaking out because he's an amateur. Okay, give me the money, give me the money, what? Give me the money. So he takes the money and he goes in, and Jean Reno and De Niro have to cover him. And of course, De Niro, as the uh, professional here, when the lights from like a boat on the Seine go by the bridge, he happens to glance up and see that there is a sniper which he suspected there would be. So he immediately fires on the sniper and they fire on the guys down the tunnel who are obviously setting them up. They take them out. They go down there. They get the money and the weapons, I guess. And they take off in their Audi and they are, here we go with the first uh, car chase. They're being chased by the, <laughs> the French cops, which a uh, family guy pointed out. Um, sounds like, sounds like a Skittles man um, standing there howling down a street. Um, it's, it's very it's a very weird uh siren sound it sounds like you're at cabaret so anyway they're being chased by the french 
and uh, the driver um, is excellent. They they're going, they, you know, they're twisting and turning down the streets, and then at some point, he pulls onto a road and gets into a parking space and chills, and they go right past him. So, and again, this was like the first um, first example I'd seen in a film of a car chase where they weren't actually going high speed the whole time. So that I thought that was pretty clever. Um, that was, you know, there's some variety and it's probably more true to life in terms of a real car chase involving these types of people. Uh, for example, uh, the most entertaining car chase I've ever seen, um, cause I like to w- watch videos of this is a recent one in LA where, um, the dude was on the highway and he was going like three miles an hour and there were like 20 cops behind him on the LA freeway. The whole freeway was shut down and it was a chase, but he was going three miles an hour. So it's like weird clown world meta version of the high speed chase, which has turned into just a joke. Right. Um, uh, anyway, so then Sean Bean, uh, jukes, he's, he, uh, obviously his body, rejects this this activity even though he did well in the situation but um he is an imposter right he's larping we know that what however he got into this group um he doesn't belong there so they get back to the warehouse and uh then there's some other operation that's coming up and um and sean bean says right here's what we're gonna do because they're, it's like Nice and then another town and they got to go to another town and like she's drawn like a crude, you know, road on the whiteboard. So he gets up and he says, one shooter there, one there. Right. And then De Niro, this is when De Niro gets up and he goes, draw it again. Draw it again. Draw it again. It was right there. Draw it again. It's a simple diagram. Draw it again. Draw it again. What, what color is the boathouse at Hanford? color is the boathouse at Hereford? What color is the boathouse at Hereford? Hereford is where the SAS regiments are based, obviously, because Sean Bean is LARPing as, I guess, ex-SAS, right? Uh, British Special Forces. He would know this easily. If, if he, honestly, though, if he were actually SAS, I don't know how he would answer that question. I guess he would never be asked the question in the first place. Um, so it's, it's an interesting scene because I watched this movie probably, I don't know, 10 times before I really made sense of like what Sean Bean is in the movie and why he's there in the first place. I guess he's there because it shows that um, his character kind of represents the entire movie's narrative uh in a, I guess in a kind of a microcosm, right? Because the narrative is about like the twists and turns of international uh, black bag stuff, right? These guys are soldiers of fortune. We don't know who they work for. We don't know where they come from. We don't know what the job is. We don't know where they're supposed to go after that. We don't know whether they're going to live or die. In fact, when they're in the, in the chase scenes, like the streets are there are the way they are. That's why they filmed it there because the streets are unpredictable. It's not like America where you get like, you get on the highway and you just go straight. Right. Or you're in New York city and it's like, you go up the avenues, you go left on the street. This is like nice. So it's all ancient streets and it's like one way, but then there's a car coming and then they got to go and that you don't know where you are. So you, you lose your sense of direction. And obviously Sean Bean, wherever he came from in this movie, um, he went in the wrong direction. He, he, he does not belong in this place. So somebody gave him an opportunity to, uh, be part of this world, I guess. And he probably is some sort of ex military, but he's LARPing as ex SAS, which, um, I don't know what special forces people, um, say, uh, in such situations. I mean, they obviously don't go around banding about like, their unit in fact like if they were active then they're not going to say those words at all like yeah i know in the 80s they would say like we're part of the teams like jesse ventura i was part of the teams and the original teams and the navy seals in 1976 we had to train on wagyu beef we had to go jump in the river and fetch a brick that was right after I was a member of the Warriors and the Warlocks Motorcycle Clubs. You call them clubs. 
because they're not gangs. They're clubs. They're they are legit. They made me a legit member of the Warlocks and the Hells Angels, and they gave me my colors. That's what you call them, your colors. And I was a member of the teams. Chris Kyle is a liar. He's a liar. Was that one okay? Was that one okay, Jethro? Jethro was watching Will Sasso's impression of uh, Jesse Ventura, and I got to say, it's pretty good. It's it's really good. I think that um, I think that Mersh does the best Jesse Ventura. In fact, he he did that prank call um, as Jesse Ventura, and that was if you've heard that, like it's pretty good because they didn't figure it out for like a good five minutes on the radio. Um, he does a good one. Um, but anyway, so, yeah, I don't know what, how they would re refer to themselves. Uh, also, Sean Bean was also in a uh, what's considered a classic um, uh, classic British movie, which is, uh, what's the movie called? It's the story of Andy McNabb, uh, Bravo 2-0, I think it's called. And it's the story of the SAS when they were caught in a crossfire ambush as part of an operation in desert storm. And I think they were captured and tortured. Um, and Sean Bean plays Andy, Mc, Andy McNabb, who's a famous, um, you know, ex SAS guy in Britain. And actually Andy McNabb, who's like a big, he's a big giant, you know, blonde uh, Brit who was legit, you know, uh, in, in SAS. Um, Andy McNabb is the weapons trainer slash uh fight consultant military consultant on a bunch of movies um he was he was involved with heat actually uh he was one of the consultants on heat and so anyway sean bean plays him in a movie and so it's interesting that it, here we go again with sas also patriot games involved sas so it's weird how actors like exist in these kind of concentric circles um but the reason for that honestly is because Casting directors have no imagination and uh, and no time, really. So um, you would think that it's like, oh, we're going to get this actor because, you know, they're a great actor and we've seen them in this. But, like, they don't watch movies or go to the theater. They just get a picture and then someone comes along and recommends them and they say, here you go. And then if they need somebody for something, it's like, well, you already played this character, basically. So here you go. Here's a job again is the way that it you know, actually turns out most of the time. Um, but anyway, so, so, uh, he gets, he gets sacked. Um, and the IRA woman says, uh, you're free to go. You can stay as long as you want. But you're free to go. Need I remind you? Don't come looking for us because we will remember you. She says something like that. You may remember us, but we'll remember you. You may know who we are, but we know who you are. Right, casino. So anyway, so he's sacked. He's gone. He's out of the picture, which is again unexpected in this film because like people knew who Sean Bean was when this movie came out. He's not the star, but like people know who he is. So for him to be in the movie and then just all of a sudden be gone is kind of strange. But actually now we see that as a trend with Sean Bean movies. I mean, we saw that um of course in Lord of the Rings. It was famous in Lord of the Rings, right? He like never makes it. So um, but he doesn't die though. He doesn't die. Um, he just kind of pieces out. So the rest of the guys, uh, Stalin, Skarsgård, uh, De Niro, Jean Reno, the driver, the IRA woman, and some other, you know, anonymous, uh, uh, you know, heavy guy. They get in the van and they got to go to, is this when they go to Nice? So they go to Nice. And actually, it's funny because when you watch the movie, I've done this a number of times, when you watch the movie, and she says her line about we we know we know who you are out loud i always go nice and then right after that on the screen they show the city of nice and it says nice which is nice right um which is pretty interesting so they go to the city of nice in uh the south of france and i have not been to nice um my friends got to go there on the french trip in high school and uh, I know that they had a hell of a time. They had such a good time that um, they got a few of them got sent home early, which is uh, it's embarrassing. But um, but anyway, they you know they were uh, so they were being boys will be boys. They were um, out there having fun and 
you know, like drinking at 16 and going to the discos. And that's what you do. Oh, come on now. I'm sorry. Dang. I left the Bluetooth on. I hope you all didn't hear that. Um, so anyway, so we go to Nice. And now what we have to do is uh, we, meaning the group of, you know, these these uh, daring do adventurers, whoever they are, they're still kind of anonymous, by the way. Uh, they have to go and find this uh, group of Russians. I think these are the Russians. There's a bald guy who looks like a bad guy. He looks like a bad guy. He's the principal, and he's got the briefcase attached to his wrist. They've got to ambush them somewhere along the road, and then they've got to, you know, eliminate them all if they can, and then take the case. They got to get the case. And again, they don't know what's in the case. De Niro makes a point of this. We got to know what's in the case. What's in the case? Is it heavy? Is it light? Does it have explosives? Is it nuclear? What's what's in the case? Is there bo- is there body parts in it? Is it going to stink? So they demand more money. Now they demand, um, uh, I think, a hundred grand a piece which is a nice little payday. Of course, uh, you know, they can get shot and killed because they're dealing with very dangerous people. And in fact, the IRA woman says, these are very dangerous people. They're unpleasant people. Who are they? They're unpleasant people. That's all you need to know. She basically says. So, um, so then what happens is they go and they, they find a, a, you know, a safe house. And everything in this movie is so cool, dude. Like, even the safe house is cool. You know, it's like a nondescript French apartment, and it's got, like, a stove. And the uh, the driver, he's the chef. He's got his little apron on, and he's smoking a cigarette. And he's like, you, you get my camels? Um, he's making, uh, uh, I don't know, French, you know, French uh, croissant. For all of them while they're sitting there, you know, they can have something. They have coffee and um, they're talking about their job. They got maps everywhere, of course. And the IRA woman is constantly on her cell phone. She's talking to her handler. She's, I don't have a, I don't have a handler. He's not my handler, but he's the handler. And then we're going to meet him. And that is Jonathan Price. Now, Jonathan Price is the dude who you've seen in so many movies. Um, he always plays a kind of a worm character. Uh, and was he in Brazil? I think that's like his biggest role. It's probably Brazil, right? Terry Gilliam. But you always think of him as a kind of an older guy with white hair, and he's got that kind of donut head. He actually played a good bad guy in um, the Tom Hardy. You guys see the Tom Hardy TV show, Taboo? He must be the only person in the world who actually like dug that TV show. I thought it was good. Uh, I liked it. Um, I liked what they did. I liked his character. I thought he was kind of cool. You know, it was Dickensian. He's kind of, he's got like a outsider element. I thought it was pretty well done. And um, Jonathan Price, of course, plays the, I guess, chairman of the, what is he? Chairman of the Dutch East India Company or something. Um, checkerboard floor, British elite, right? And they're trying to uh, eliminate people and take huge, um, you know, huge swaths of land, which is what the show's about. And Jonathan Price plays a, a very wormish character in that. So in this, of course, he shows up, and immediately we do not like him, right? First of all, his accent is too much. Um, I've never heard anyone uh, speak like this before, including um, people that when you're in the pub and you know that the pub is a paramilitary pub because the people come in to collect their money at the end of the night and you have to, you know, just just... Just be yourself and don't cause any trouble and don't look at people, right? Uh, I never heard anyone talk like this. What are you doing, right? Where's the kiss? Tell them you can't get more, man. Do it now. We got to get it now. It's like you can hear his speech coach, like, making him practice the word now over and over. So anyway, well, enough, enough about that. So he's the handler, obviously, and he has an interest in getting this case. He he wants these this group to go ahead with their operation and to get this case. We don't know what's in the case, but we know it's important to him. So uh, they're sitting around, and um, the IRA woman finds out that through like some sort of recon that, no, they're up at the villa. They're having their eyes wide shut party. We can't do the operation today because they're staying put for the night being um, total Euro degenerates doing whatever they do up there, right? Um, listening to uh, 
Rock Me Amadeus and um, the Baja Boys and, uh, you know, playing with their briefcase or whatever. So De Niro's like, mm, we're, we're sitting around. So it doesn't make sense. Stellan Skarsgård says, I wish there was something to do. Don't like this, this uh, sitting around. We are doing something. We're sitting here. We're waiting. You know what? Never mind. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go figure this out. So De Niro goes on a little recon, and uh, first he goes to the hotel where the people are. This is a cool scene. He goes to the uh, the luxury um, South of France hotel, and he walks in. He's got his uh, his you know his camera, and he has uh, the IRA woman who's kind of dolled up a little bit on his arm, and he's got a nice blazer on, you know, and they're pretending to be. Uh, loud, sort of loudish American tourists, right? It's a gr- it's a good cover. Uh, he's especially good at this. So they walk in, they spot the people, and he sees them coming, and he does this clever thing, which now is like, I feel like he did this thing, which was probably standard uh, operating procedure, and now everybody kind of knows about it, which is that he says. Uh, excuse, excuse me, sir. Um, can you take a picture of me and my wife? Like, like, you know, take a picture. You're just gonna snap away. Just snap away. And meanwhile, he's like snapping away pictures of them coming down the hall. So he's, you know, it looks like he's just showing him the camera, but he's photographing his um these people. And then they come behind him. He gets uh the woman on his arm, and he says, oh, "Just snap, snap some pictures. Yeah. Get the background. Just snap away. Snap away. Right. Take a lot of pictures. A lot of pictures. We." We love this country. And the guy, this, you know, dingbat guy or whatever, is just taking pictures. Meanwhile, the bad guys are in the background. So then De Niro does this thing where he says, like, give me a second. He walks over. He puts the, uh, one of the, so- like, brass signs, and he leans it against the, um, the luggage cart. And then he goes over to the guy, and take my luggage up, right? He says, take my luggage up. Then he goes back, and he says, let me take a picture of you and my wife. Yeah, you get in the picture. Yeah, I'm a... I want some local flair, right? Yeah, you get in the picture. Yeah, put your arm around my wife. Yeah, and meanwhile, he's snapping away. And while he does that, the uh, the bellhop moves the luggage cart. The sign falls on the ground. It makes a loud crash. And then he takes pictures of how this, you know, this opposing team, the bad guys, deal with protecting their principal and the briefcase. And, you know, it's it's pretty cool. It's well done. Because it's just, it's just the film showing us um, what happens in the course of the narrative. It's like they don't need to tell us that this is what they do. He doesn't need to tell us that you know he learned this as a spy. It's just they just do this thing, and it's it's kind of funny the way that he does it. Um, he goes back to the apartment. He says they're good. They're good. They're very good. Look at the way that they protect the principal. This guy grabs his gun. This guy covers this guy. This guy, you know, is a lookout. Um, a real life example of that, by the way, is if you look at the film or the photographs of the Reagan incident, right? With uh, with uh, famous YouTuber John Hinckley Jr. I'm I'm being uh, sincere there. He is on YouTube. Um, if you look at uh, that event, right, when that happened in 1981, um, you actually can see, like, the Secret Service in action in a way that I, I don't think we've gotten to see that many other times. Like, for instance, uh, one of the guys, like, kind of on the perimeter has an Uzi. Where'd this Uzi come from? Because the Secret Service just wears, like, a, a suit with a blazer, but this guy's got an Uzi. Another guy's got, like, a, you know, another guy's got a gun. Another, and it's pretty cool to see how they operate and how they... um you know, how they move, right? Um, and uh, what's what are y'all saying? I'm going to look in the chat real quick. Jason, uh, the uh, who's been knighted tonight, says, Maddie, how bizarre. I still can't uh, wrap my head around a guy writing that song, like, Who Let the Dogs Out? Yeah, that sounds good. Add some uh, wolves, and you got to uh, hit, boys. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to barge into y'all's conversation there, but um, what a brilliant idea, right? I mean, like, that's the earworm of all earworms. Let's take a song that is totally nonsensical and infantile. We're going to have a hook and a phrase. Um, put, a, put a melody around it, right? Get, uh, get uh, you know, 
what's his face over there who did the last melody because they you know have a stable of producers here you go here's your song bam uh now we're going to promote it and here's the song i mean imagine being the in the circle of people that like do that you know and consistently right uh the 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 kind of behind the the a and r people and the producers who like are able to do that it reminds me of um charles sheen in that sitcom he was in what's the sitcom called uh men, men two and a half men remember he's a jingle writer right and uh he's like a famous uh jingle writer and he writes that song he goes by the name charlie waffles and he's like he's just really good at it i think that's kind of cool it's it's interesting um, there's a movie about that, which is, is it Under the Silver Lake that's about that? And Maddie Digital Minefield right there covered that movie with Jerry at Exposing Powerful Lies. Didn't y'all analyze that movie? Because the movie ends up being about that, right? The people who write the, write the music for the Laurel Canyon people um, under the Silver Lake. So anyway, back to the movie. Um, so... So now we know how these people operate, and then what happens is uh, they want to do another recon. So De Niro takes the IRA woman out in the car, and they're you know on the street, and they're looking at the the estate way up on the hill. And this is the kind of thing where I'm watching it, and you know you always imagine what would you do in this situation. It's like you're in this car, and you have no excuse to be there. So if like the cops come, what are you going to do, right? Well, I guess they're older and, you know, they're tourists and we'll probably stop on the side of the road in France like that all the time. So whatever. And then that actually happens. So the cops come and De Niro says, oh, take out the map, take out the map. So now they're looking at the map, right? Oh, we're lost. And they drive by and then like another car comes and then they make out. So, of course, the cops are like, oh, he's France. We better uh, stop on this side of the uh, avenue all the time. Uh, and they uh, love to uh, kiss like we invented here. This is uh, here. How do they say here in France? Here, here. We um, we invented this here. Uh, the French kiss. That's terrible. I'm sorry. That's a terrible impression. But anyway, yes. But they did invent that. Um. So they're making out. So the cops, of course, drive by. And then what happens is they stop making out. And then the IRA woman, she kind of likes this. So um. She goes back and she starts, you know, they get friendly again and the scene cuts. But we know that, you know, these two people involved in uh, international uh, gun, you know, daring do uh, mercenary operations with paramilitary ties. You know, they have uh, they, they they're hot blooded and they have passions. So I guess they um, I guess they. What is it? That, what is it that Jay said that time? Um, it was, it was in, was it in Death Race? Remember Sylvester Stallone and what, no, it was in uh, Demolition Man. What does Sylvester Stallone call the, uh, the nasty act, the filthy act in Demolition Man? What does he call it? He says like, hey, I didn't know we were going to make, it's not whoopee. He says, um, come on, y'all. You remember the J stream about Demolition Man? And or if you've seen the film, Sylvester Stallone like has a weird word for sex in that movie. What does he say? Hey, we're gonna we're gonna do the do the the clam. We're gonna do the is it hunka chunka? Is that what it is? Hey, we're gonna get a hunka chunka. I think that's right. That's got to be it. Shouts out to Cronosis out there. Yeah, yeah. He, he doesn't say whoopee. He says that's what in. In Family Guy, the old lady that Brian's dating says, whoopee. Um, remember, she says, put the keys on the, just put them on the shiffer rope. The what? I don't know what you're talking about. The shiffer rope. The Chesterfield. Put them on the Chesterfield. What the fuck are you talking about, lady? I don't know what these words are. What is it? What is a shiffer rope? Seriously, what is that? What is a shit? Is it shiffer rope? Shiffer robe? What, what is that? Is that the rope, like, for the, the drapes? Is that a furniture? What is that? Shiffer rope. Somebody, please. Oh, my God. 
I'm going schizo mode tonight, y'all. I need to know what a shiffer robe is. Shif shiffer robe. I gotta look this up. How do you even spell that? It's gotta be a French term, a French furniture term. Shiffer robe. Shiffer. Oh, shiffer robe. Uh, a closet-like piece of furniture that combines a long space for hanging clothes. That is a wardrobe or armoire with a chest of drawers. <laughs> My mom says, my mom texts and says, it's a small armoire. I am an uncultured swine. I just know that um, uh, Kramer gets robbed of the armoire. It's a Farbman, right, in Seinfeld. So a Schiffer robe. Okay. My apologies to all the cultured people in the uh, audience. I'm an uncultured swine. So anyway, uh, I don't even know how I got to that. Um, they do the, uh, hunk of chunka. They, they do the hunk of chunka. They get, and then they go back to the apartment and then something interesting happens here. Um, uh, they, Stellan Skarsgård has some spray paint in his hands, which they don't make a big deal of showing, but he like, he spray paints the window and we assume when we're watching it, that it's so, you know, it's, it's uh, opaque and nobody can see what they're doing inside. Right. In case there's surveillance is what we assume just from this like half second of seeing that. But that is going to be important later on. And obviously that was one of the uh, items that he put on the list for Jean Reno to pick up for him. And, you know, it seems like it makes sense, right? Spray painting the window. Um, the next day, the operation happens. And this is like, this is probably the best scene in the movie because, um, first of all, we see Robert De Niro in the back seat of this, um, what what's he what's he in the back seat of? Is it a Mercedes? It's like a diesel Mercedes, a yellow Mercedes. John Reno is in the front seat. You know they're having a little chat. They're very calm. It's the morning. Um, and people are on their way because we see Stellan Skarsgård in the back of a lorry somewhere else, and the IRA woman's driving it. Skarsgård is now like full NSA mode because he's got '90s computers, and he has uh. So he's tracking their cell phones, which is pretty cool because, again, you're watching the movie and you're going, how are they possibly going to know when they're leaving and where they are? Well, it's the, the cell phones, right? Uh, 90s, you know, Nextel cell phones. They can just track their location. Um, so they're going to converge at some point. We also see the driver. He uh, goes off the road. He's got his Audi in another place. So there's going to be a there's going to be an ambush. And. De Niro and Jean Reno are chilling. Um, De Niro in the back seat has like a, a newspaper, and at some point, Jean Reno gets out and he's got this little device and he uh, controls the stoplights. So when we see the prince, the the the, the bat, the targets coming down the road, he changes the stoplight, puts it on red, and then De Niro kind of casually gets out of the car. He's we see him by the way. He moves the newspaper and he's got a he's got a disassembled bazooka sitting in his lap, and he you know he assembles it puts the rounds in, and then uh, when the time comes, he gets out of the car and just, like, aims it and fires at the lead vehicle, you know, which explodes uh, in the street. And this is cool. Frank and Imer did this really well because it's enough explosion um, to, to shock the passersby, right, in the town and to make us, like, pay attention, make the audience pay attention. But it's not it's not like CGI. It's not over the top. It's not, it's just matter of fact. He has this weapon. He uses it. It's for a purpose. And then that's it. So he does that. Then Jean Reno uh, presses a button and then that's the, um, the gunfire simulator. So the, the bodyguards in the other car get out of the car and then they turn that opens up their body so that De Niro can then take them out. It's this is very, you know, tactical. So De Niro shoots them. He's got a, he's got like a damn chopper in his hands, right? He's got like a high powered rifle with a, a, I don't know what it is. It's like H and K or HK or something, but he shoots these dudes. They're taken out. Uh, Jean Reno has a, like a nine millimeter or something. And he shoots a bunch of people. But what's interesting is that, um, did I say, pa what did I say? Passerbys? Did I say passerbys? <laughs> no, surely I said passersby. Um, kind of like uh surgeons general, right? 
Anyway, so um, one thing that happens in this is it is brutal because we see these poor people like standing there buying their French onions or whatever at the market, and they get caught in the crossfire and they just uh, they fall over NPC video game style. But it it looks very true to life, right? I mean, it looks like what. By the way, since this movie uh, was released, this is like commonplace, right? We see this all the time, uh, mass events. Um, and it's very strange in the movie because you you never see, you know, um, just the the city people get hit in the gunfire in films. They always make a point of not including that, right? Because it's for a number of reasons. One, it's gratuitous. They got to, just a bunch of reasons, right? Why do that? But in this, they get mowed down. And we see that uh, the coldness of the, good guys, you know, the good guys for us, I guess, and the bad guys, it's like all, all the rest of this, they're just collateral. They just, they're doing their job and they did this in a public place and the people just, they just don't have any feelings about it, which is like, ugh. so then um, what happens is there's a crisscross, crisscross, because uh, Stellan Skarsgård says, give me, the, give me the case, give me the case. And then De Niro looks down, he sees that his hands are silver um, and then he, he, you know, smartly throws the case away, like under a car and there's an explosion. So we learned that they've been crisscrossed, right? Because Skarsgård has flipped the case and he's replaced it with an imposter MacGuffin. And that's what the earlier, um, spray paint was for because he spray painted the case, right? So now Skarsgård is gone and he's got the actual case. He stole it. And in the meantime, um, I think this is where De Niro gets shot. So De Niro gets hit in the belly um also the the driver has had his throat cut and jonathan price is in the back seat of the car let's go take off drive he makes the ira woman drive off and they leave so now de niro and john reno are um they gotta hijack a car they get in the car they drive off into like the dolomites or somewhere they're up in the mountains and then and de niro says i gotta take care of this take me to a Take me to a vet. There's something, you know, I can boost the, I can boost what I need. He's been shot in the gut. And then that's funny because when you're watching it, it's like you assume they're already going to get him help, but I guess not. And, uh, and he has to tell Jean Reno, like, okay, man, I've been shot. I'm going to die here. I'm leaking pretty bad. So, uh, Jean Reno says, uh, I know, I know a guy, I know a man, but I know just the man. It's, uh, I know a safe house. The safe house, of course, is the home of Hugo Drax. Michael Lonsdale, the uh, Anglo-French actor who looks like um, a retired lion in this movie. He's got his long hair and he's got his, he's sitting there in his um, like weird French samurai expensive home in seclusion. And he's, of course, he's painting little Ronin and samurai, right? That's his little hobby. So he lets them in. And of course, uh, we assume from this, of course, that uh, the Lonsdale character also is formerly, you know, of this life somehow. He's uh, related to them. Um, so, you know, it says, I'm going to need these tools. Yeah, you, know, you got to put me up here. Is it, would you like some whiskey? No, I need to know what I'm doing here. So De Niro is the one who has to operate on himself or direct the operation, which is interesting that these other two guys don't know to do it. So he gets a mirror. This is a, a, a pretty well done scene. He gets a mirror. Um, and sets it up. He uh, sterilizes the wound on his stomach, which looks very nasty. It's, you know, it's leaking. Uh, he says, uh, when you go in, like, you got to open it up. You got to get the clamp. You got to clamp on the, you got to clamp on the, uh, clamp on the gun, on the bullet. Don't pull it out until you get it. And of course, Jean Reno messes it up. We can hear it. It's like ASMR. He grabs the bullet and then it escapes the tongs or whatever. And it's still in there. Finally, he grabs it, pulls it out, and then, you know, puts the, puts the uh, round in the metal cup. De Niro says, you know, sew it up. Um, I think I'm going to pass out now. So he passes out. So he's successfully operated on himself. And this is a great scene because um, it, it shows the other side to these characters and what they have to deal with. You know, not only are they... Uh, are they hard people and cold people and they, you know, are good at improvising 
they're good at making uh, stratagems and plans, but they're good at improvising. They're good at like their surroundings, you know, using their senses. They're good at weapons. They all have a specialty. But also, they are very good at, um, you know, they have to keep going, and they sometimes they have to uh, operate on themselves, which is, you know, a crazy thing to imagine. You watch it and you go, they make it look very easy how he does it. But of course, I mean, like, I don't know. You know, people do this. Um, we saw, remember Mark Wahlberg did this in that movie Sniper. I think that this movie was very influential in terms of action movies later because it's so well done and it's almost like a school of film. Um, I can imagine directors in Hollywood like watching this film and going, yeah, I need to put this type of scene in my film. Um, that, uh, you know, the, the same kind of scene happens in the movie Sniper with uh, Mark Wahlberg, except, you know, he goes to a vet and he gets sugar and, you know, he, uh, whatever, he cleans out his wounds. But, um, yes, very good point, uh, Maddie. Um, you know, Anton Sugar, of course, which we covered in, um, in our No Country for Old Men stream, right? Remember, he, <laughs> he blows up the car outside as a distraction so he could go rob the pharmacy. Then he goes back to the hotel, he cleans his wounds, he puts the shot in, and then he recovers, you know. And when he does that, by the way, you can tell that he's suffering. And if Anton Chigurh is in pain, then he it must be really bad because he's a, a total psychopath, right? Um, and a hard person. So anyway, um, what are you guys talking about? DeBarge? Yeah, DeBarge. DeBarge, uh, Anton Chigurh. Well, he's a... Uh... What's Woody Harrelson say? Well, he's a uh, he's a dangerous psychopath, um, but I don't care. I can go after him, you know. Big mistake. Um. So after De Niro recovered, I gotta get another drink, y'all. Uh, give me a second here. My Red Bull is empty. I'm gonna go get my interesting drink that I picked up today. Give me one second. This is our intermission. How long have we been going? I told you this was going to be kind of uh, freestyle, fast and loose, chill stream after dark, right? Okay. All right, everybody take a break real quick. Don't leave. Just go um, go and get your uh, go and get your Red Bulls and uh, smoke them if you got them, I guess. Give me one second. Y'all know that uh, y'all know that Keanu Reeves says "Okie dokie" in every film. Bet you guys didn't know that. All right, so let's go. Um, so what happens next? Okay, this is kind of the intermission of the film. It's not a long film. It's about two hours. Um, so, by the way, I picked up this drink today, and I thought you guys would like this. It's, uh, it's uh, let's see. A party in every bottle. It says uh, Lennon Aid. It's Lennon Aid. Have you guys seen this before? <laughs> Uh, I thought I would get that. Um, Lennon Aid. I picked it up at the hardware store today. So, for some reason they had it at a hardware store. That's weird. Oh, please. What is this? Um, it is. 
I don't even know what is in this drink. It's a uh, it's a red lemonade. Yeah, in uh, in 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 America, you drink lemonade. In Russia, lemonade drink you. It's some kind of dirty commie soda. Um, so um, so here's what happens: a commie soda made in like. Oh, made in like Paul Pepper, Virginia, or something. Um, it's pretty cool, though. Just got a hammer and sickle on it. That's wild. And I mean, it is in Russian on the car on the label. Um, and it is made in. Uh, where's it made? Whatever. It's not important. It, it, it says totally recyclable. So it's. Okay, whatever. Um, so, so De Niro recovers, um, you know, overnight or whatever from his uh, terrible gunshot wound, right? Um, in the belly, he's got a gut shot, which is terrible. And while he's recovering, you know, he goes into the other room. He's got his little terry, uh, borrowed terry cloth robe, and he's drinking a little espresso, totally De Niro style. And he walks in and he starts talking to Michael Lonsdale, and here's where. Uh, Lonsdale, Hugo Drax, tells him the legend of the, uh, have you heard the legend of the uh, 47 Ronin, right? The uh, masterless samurai. So one night they sneak into their whatever castle and they get their revenge and then they all uh, commit a seppuku, right? They commit seppuku and um, because of their honor, right? And at that point, De Niro says they chose wrong. They 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 committed seppu seppu what's the what's the name seppu while he's drinking his little coffee, but this is a an interesting bit of dialogue because it's we're gonna learn that this is all um this is all fake it's all a front and this is a great example of the not really the unreliable narrator but the unreliable protagonist because. Of course, you you have to remember throughout this movie that that these are shadowy people, and we can like we can have our loyalties. You know, we give them our loyalties just by like we want them to do well, we want them to succeed, we want them to win, we want the the good guys to win. But the point of the film is that um, in that world, like the people aren't really you can't know them, and they're not who they say they are by definition. So even at this point, when De Niro is talking about they chose wrong, they should have gone for the money. The money is more important. Uh, the the money is more important than the 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 honor, the seppu. But we're gonna learn that um that actually that's the complete opposite of what he truly thinks, right? Um, nevertheless, Michael Lonsdale is retired in his uh, mountaintop French villa or whatever as this, you know. Lion, lionine, uh, sage guy painting his um his samurai in his happy retirement, and so they get well. And um, I'll try to speed it up here. So what happens next is, uh, they Jean Rito and De Niro have to go and find. They have to find where the bad guys are. So they decide to go after the. They want to find the case, but they got to go after. They they. They track somebody, and then we see that Stellan Skarsgård has been kidnapped by uh, Jonathan Price, the IRA guy. He's being beaten up um, in some sort of French bathroom. I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to give you a beating, and he beats him up, which is weird. Why Why does Skarsgård, like, let him do that? It's very strange. Um, it gets more convoluted from here, and then uh, next we... Crack them, and we find them again, and we're there's going to be another ambush and another car chase in a in a long tunnel, and uh, there's an interesting thing that happens here because they end up in a, in the ruins of a of a Roman Colosseum in France, and one of the bad guys recognizes Vincent, who is um, John Reno, and he says, "Well, where do I know you from?" And he says, uh, "Vienna." Ah, yes. Well, I'm sorry, I have to kill you. And at that point, De Niro saves him and shoots the bad guy, but 
Uh, no, that was right before. That was right before. Yeah, he got, he got, that's how he got his gut shot. Nevertheless, it doesn't change the, what I'm talking about in the analysis. It, my point is that the exterior settings are indicative of what's happening with the characters because they're in a coliseum and they're in the round, just like in the world, they're like, they go from place to place. There are no like real barriers for them. Their operations can take them anywhere. And they are gladiators, right? They're, I mean, uh, in the, where's the book? In the um, Manchette book, it makes it clear, which is kind of this same sort of world. It makes it clear that uh, a lot of these characters are involved on the periphery of the Red Brigades and gladio operations in the 70s and 80s. Now, this movie takes place in the 90s, but it's not a stretch to think that, like, the older ones like De Niro and Jean Reno and the kind of grizzled characters in this, if they'd been around for a few years, then yeah, they probably would have been had something to do with Gladio and Red Brigades and uh, Batter Meinhof because anybody involved in uh, international terrorism, right, or ex special forces or this this kind of world with crime syndicates and all this, it's it's a big network where they run into each other again and again. Sometimes they work together. Sometimes they have to, they work against each other. And the, um, the elimination thing that inevitably comes up is sort of just par for the course or, you know, you know what you signed up for. Um, so it's interesting though, that they, they set the scene in a literal Coliseum again with, uh, innocent bystanders, um, including like there's a bunch of kids and, uh, they make a point of this one scene where Skarsgård is demanding uh, more money because he has the case. And so he meets with this guy and he puts his silencer, um, whatever his weapon is, he, he aims it at like a girl on a playground. And he says, basically like, do you agree? And we're it's supposed to imply like, if you don't like, he's just going to start killing people indiscriminately. And even the bad guy he's meeting with is like, what are you doing, dude? Like chill. Um, I'll agree to it. He makes the agreement. And then of course, Skarsgård shoots him in the head anyway. But it shows that the, we thought that Stellan Skarsgård's character, um, was one of the good guys that we were rooting for at the beginning because he's dressed nicely. He's calm. He's a calm demeanor. He kind of gets along with De Niro and he's part of their team. Um, but now we see that he just crisscrossed him and he's like, this guy's terrible, right? Uh, we learned that he's probably, you know, ex-KGB um, or East German or something, uh, probably KGB trained. But he's involved with the business, which happens at the end of the movie. They trace uh, the bad guys to a skating rink because that's where Skarsgård got the um, replacement case. They're, remember, they're going after the briefcase, uh, which is a like an ice skate case. Um, so they start looking for skating rinks. Where's the what's the big skate? thing happening. Oh, it's Katarina Vitt who's skating uh, in, wh where do they end up? Vienna? Is it Vienna? They end up somewhere. I don't know. Somewhere in Europe. It's not important at this, at this point. They end up somewhere in Europe and Katarina Vitt, who was the uh, superstar hot ice skater of you know, when, when I used to get a subscription to Sports Illustrated for kids when I was like 12. I remember her being on the cover and I was like, it's like she's not hot but like for an ice skater, I guess, who they're trying to make them hot, like I guess she's hot, you know. Uh, but she gets marked out in the movie. She's skating to um that song in Step Brothers. Right? That song, you know what song I'm talking about. She's skating to that. And the bad guy says, um, if you know, Skarsgard says, if I don't report back to my handler or whatever in 30 seconds, um, they're gonna snipe. Katarina Vitt. And the Russian guy's like, nah. And then he shoots him in the head, and then she gets shot on the skating rink. Um, melee ensues. Uh, absolute chaos in the skating rink, which is a good cover for um, Jonathan Price and all the bad guys. And it's, uh, we're trying to, at this point, we're like, what is happening? Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Um, De Niro uh, goes up to the IRA woman in the car. She's in a car, and he says to her, get out of here, get out of here. 
don't you see? Don't you see? I never left. I never left. In other words, he's not X. He's not a mercenary. He's just uh, he's just a CIA, uh, you know, directorate of operations, um, you know, hi- hired assassin infiltrator guy. He's just it's just a CIA op. And we know that because we see De Niro's uh, buddy appear again. And uh, a scene earlier, they couldn't track uh, the bad guy. So they they De Niro reached out to his uh, CIA buddy or his NSA buddy um, who he saw like in in town. He was like, hey, hey. Uh, you know which way to the market? And the guy's like, how, how you know I speak English? He's like, you got, a, you got an English paper right there. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Give me the number. I'll track the bad guy. So she gets out of town, um, and now we know that the whole thing is a CIA op because um, they're going after Seamus, not the MacGuffin briefcase. The whole thing is about, guess what the whole movie ends up being about? It's a, This is why I like it. It's about the troubles. The whole movie is about the troubles in Northern Ireland because in the end, um, they they kill Jonathan Price. John Reno gets shot. Um, in the in the meantime, he saves De Niro, who gets shot again. And then um we hear a radio report, of course, just like the Saint, just like the gunman, you know, that's the uh, Deus Ex Machina sort of or the chorus, rather. It's like the Greek chorus appears, and we, you know, we learn the the exposition and then the resolution in this. And the radio report says, oh, BBC World Service. National terrorist Seamus Mallon has been caught and killed by the CIA, which would never be in the news, um, at least the details of it. But we learn that there is now a peace accord between the Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland. And this occurred because this one dissident, um, this provo, whatever he was, was uh, mucking things up and was trying to prevent peace by, you know, whatever circuitous operations he was running. The briefcase obviously had something. Maybe it was a knock list, like in Mission Impossible, or, you know, uh, where the weapons can be found. Who knows what was in it? But it doesn't really matter because now he's dead and now there's peace. And this is interesting because the movie was released in 1998 and that's um, Good Friday Agreement. So it reflects. Uh, Reality, because there is peace in Northern Ireland. Um, they they had the Good Friday Agreement, and uh, and the Loyalists and the Republicans, right? The uh, the Protestants and the Catholics were able to come together. Uh, Sinn Fein and the DUP, Jerry Adams and Ian Paisley and Dusty Spence were able to come together. They had to get rid of my dog Adair. He was exiled. He was exiled to Scotland, right? Um, but it, there's no more paramilitary war, and there's peace. Of course, you know, it's a tenuous peace. But I think it's so interesting that, like, the movie came out the same year that the peace accord happened, and that's that's not a, you know, it was this is like 30 years in the making, right? It's not like they just, Oh yeah, there'll be peace soon, and then they made the movie. It's like that was a, a fantasy at the time. So I think that's an interesting thing that they do with the movie. So of course, you know, we the whole point was that uh, the third party, in this sense, the uh, CIA, was going after this guy because of, I guess, the infiltration of the mercenary group. Um, that makes me wonder what again, what like Sean Bean was doing there. Um, what what was this point? Who put him there? Very odd. Um, so, anyway, that's that's the end of uh, Ronan. We see the, uh, Jean Reno and Robert De Niro again, like in this little bar at the end. Uh, they buy each other a drink, and you know um, they both go their separate ways, and that's the end. And it's, I mean, again, like this is a great movie because um, rather than just, I know I've given you like an extensive rundown of the plot here with an analysis kind of mixed in. It's a beautiful movie because, um, beautiful. It's a great movie because, first of all, uh, it's it's kind of like of a bygone era now. It's there were a bunch of movies about espionage and assassinations and you know uh, international stuff that happened in the that came out in the seventies and then kind of in the eighties, and of course this is at the tail end of the nineties. But you don't really get movies like this anymore. 
and it's a uh, it relies on dialogue plot um and really uh, it relies on a plot that requires the audience to pay attention and and uh to be interested in the events even though you know we seem to we we're brought into the events as if we are part of it even though our lives are so different from what these characters are, right? And that's kind of the same with any film. But it's like, in reality, none of us probably have anything to do with what these characters do, right? Um, they're in actual operations. They're in, you know, they've got passports and, you know, they're gun running and just all this stuff. And yet we feel like we're part of this world right away in the film. And we're we're making decisions and predictions based on how we feel about the characters, and I think that that's that's the sign of a of a solid work of art. Um, also, it's interesting because you know a lot of times these movies will have younger, um, better looking people in in central roles for obvious reasons. Like one example is uh, there was a spy movie that came out a few years ago where the guy's being trained as a CIA you know, a, a badass or whatever. And it's got Michael Keaton is the guy training the guy. And um, the guy being trained was the guy in the Maze Runner. You guys remember this film? Um, it's called American, American, American Assassin or something. Um, and it's a decent flick, but that is a completely different style of movie because it's a post big nine movie. And so the entire tone and actually the exposition of the movie is totally different. The reason for that guy, um, wanting to be a CIA assassin or whatever he is, is that he was like, he was there in Egypt or whatever, when the event happened and all the people got mowed down on the beach and his girlfriend was, you know, uh, murked out in front of him. So he's like, ah, I hate ISIS. I'm gonna go be a CIA terrorist, which is very, is is like an interesting idea for a movie, but um, you know, it's fantasy, right? It's it's fantasy. At least in this movie, this is pre Big Nine, but in this movie, um, the characters are, I guess, more realistic. They're just like more average looking. They fit into the background. They don't look like they're like pumped up or muscular they look kind of out of shape uh unshaven right um and yet they can do anything anywhere uh they're kind of older um they are older colder more objective more dispassionate more professional and they don't have this like emotional reaction to doing these jobs which is often the case or what is presented in film right uh that you know, there's some sort of trauma that takes place for the protagonist to, you know, become this assassin or whatever. Also, the CIA assassin, um, uh, well, C CIA assassins, um, uh, remember the movie The Recruit with uh, Colin Farrell, which is a decent film. Decent, it's pretty good, actually. You know, that one's about CIA training in the farm, uh, which is in Virginia. Uh, and the knock list, right? The non-official cover. My name's Al Pacino. You know who I work for? I, uh, I saw you at the uh, at the science exhibit at MIT. They call it MIT. You want to come work for the CIA? That's who I work for. It's very bizarre how he recruits him, right? He says, "You know who I work for? You want to know? You want to know who I work for?" Look at this newspaper. I just, I just circled three letters. C I A. Get it? That's who I work for. You want to come work for them? Right now, you, you know, you're at MIT. You're a nerd, but you're very smart. Also, I'm a bad guy. I'm using you because I'm tired of this. They haven't rewarded me all my years, my years at the agency. They haven't rewarded me, so I'm gonna be a bad guy. Right. I mean, come on. But, um, you know, that movie, that movie has another example of this, like Colin Farrell, 
you know, he's in love and, you know, the characters get emotional and, you know, they get tied to each other. In Ronin, it's like, first of all, the, the title, you know, reflects the title. These guys um, supposedly are the masterless samurai because they're soldiers of fortune, right? They are mercenaries existing in this shadowy world of uh, adventure and money and, you know, illegal stuff and gun running and uh, drug trafficking, probably all this kind of stuff. But they they seem to be um, they they look very normal and they don't have the kind of emotions that would compromise uh, the operations. Anyway, uh, I think that's a really strong point about this film. Also, um, the fact that it's you know it's international and it's really like one of the last great movies um, before Big Nine, right? Because Big Nine happened you know three years later and course when that happened this type of movie like really went out the window for a long time i mean you remember uh what was being released the weekend of big nine event in fact the, i remember this vividly the billboard on the side of um one of the lower manhattan buildings it was a giant billboard that like took up the whole building was zoolander right and he's like leaning on the building and uh i remember that there were a bunch of movies in the works and they pulled the movies and then they replaced them with like stupid comedies. Like uh, one was Martin Lawrence, Black Knight. Remember that movie? I love Martin Lawrence, but they obviously, they fast tracked the movie to replace some of the other movies because they were like, oh, we can't really take this right now. We got to have something, you know, silly and stupid. And then later on, you know, we got into the uh, topical movies about you know, big nine and stuff. The first one of those I think was, was pretty bold. I think it was just Oliver Stone's, um, world trade center. I, I haven't seen the film and I, I'm like, I don't know. Honestly, I, I just don't want to, I like Oliver Stone. I love Oliver Stone. I think he's one of the great filmmakers, but I just don't want to watch world trade center. I just don't. Right. Um, it bothered me that it came out so soon uh, after the thing. Um, I thought that was bizarre. Uh, like, I mean, I know Stone isn't capitalizing on the on the event at all. That's he's probably doing the opposite. But I just thought it was kind of like what? Um, I remember that the band Jimmy Eat World had. Uh, their album came out on 9-11, I think, on, on the Big Nine, 2001. And the album was called, Re I think it was called Reject All American. And they they pulled the CD, it took away the title, and changed the artwork on the cover of the, of the album, which just, it, it's just, it just shows you, it's indicative of the fact that um, you could say that such things are, you know, just bands and, uh, you know, the corporations, they want to, they're patriotic also, and they want to be sensitive to the feelings of the, of, you know, the people who have undergone these, these massive events. But I, I think it also just shows you that, you know, isn't that a great example of like culture creation kind of in different light, like an extreme example, because when confronted with it, the alibi is simply, yeah, well, we didn't want we didn't want to uh, traumatize people further by um, releasing this album, by releasing an album that's called Reject All America. Who cares? Right. If people didn't like it or they had a problem with it, they just wouldn't buy the album. So anyway. Wow, I'm really going off on some rants tonight about what grinds my gears. All right. So I'm going to finish up. You guys, please uh, like and share the stream. Um. Uh, yeah, Maddie says Slayer was supposed to drop a tape on the Big Nine. Um, oh, Donna says that her daughter watched Josie and the Pussycats. Um, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, let's see. I remember in Moonstruck there were a few references to nine one one Ray Towers. Um, and remember we covered uh, I covered with Jay the only I think the only film that was made inside the actual World Trade uh, WTC which was the movie Network. You remember that? Um, have you guys seen the movie Man on Wire, the documentary? Not the Joseph Gordon-Levitt film about the documentary, which is also fine. 
But the documentary itself, which came out in 2007 and won Best Documentary Oscar, is very well done. I, I thought that was fantastic. And that's a true story. You know, the French dude, like, strung a wire between the World Trade Centers and, you know, high-wired it in the 70s. What an innocent time. I also remember on MTV Sports, that dude base jumping off of the top of the building. And Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone 2. Hey, you're... remember. Remember Trump is in the movie. Macaulay Culkin, that's what they call him, you know. I like this kid. He's a wonderful kid. You know, they said he was uh, emancipated from his parents. I'm not sure what that means, but, uh, you know, he's a little rascal running around. He's got no place to live in New York. He's going to go on top of the World Trade Center. That's what they call it. He's in the movie. And Macaulay Culkin goes to uh, the roof of the World Trade Center. And then I remember after Big Nine, Somebody photoshopped, and a lot. I, I, I actually, this fooled me for a second. Um, uh, at the time, they photoshopped, uh, someone on the roof of the trade center with the plane coming right at the building. Um, which is, you know, obviously, well, it's not that ridiculous. I mean, they found the passports in the rubble right there on the street, so this is not that ridiculous. Yeah, Dan Cortez, who has the same birthday as I do. Um, Anyway, so, so yeah, so that was Ronin, the 1998 uh, Robert De Niro film. Um, some people now, of course, uh, don't even want to um, watch a Robert De Niro film at all, right? because uh, because of his kind of repulsive um, attitude towards certain things, and you know his his public uh, what he said about whatever, um, which is annoying, but. Um, and that's fine. That's their prerogative. But this is one of his, I think this is one of his best films. It's like real, you know, De Niro. Um, and I've actually, speaking of Big Nine, I've actually, uh, um, I wrote a poem uh, for my book back in Belfast um, uh, called The Falling Man. And it, and it was before the, you know, now everybody knows about The Falling Man. Um, it's very famous now, but uh, this was before that. Um, I had seen a a news story on Channel 4 over there, a brief story about the actual, you know, they called him the falling man. It was like the first one. And um, so I wrote this poem about it, and uh, I'm not going to read it because it's 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 weird looking back on it because it's, um, he, I don't know. Maybe I will one day, but um, it's, uh, that is a, that is a crazy story because, you know, that was that that was a guy and that happened. So um, so I'm just gonna end here with uh there's ADH. There's our friend ADH, um, who I think is looking at the uh Barbie analysis that I just did. You guys, if you haven't seen the Barbie analysis that I did um before the Shakespearean Much Ado About Nothing stream, which I just did, please go back and check that out. I think it was um I think it was pretty good. I think we did pretty well with that one. Of course, um Last night was uh, Jamie and Rachel's analysis, and um, thought I was look very, looking forward to it very much. And I think that you know they came up with some of the uh, same conclusions, the big conclusions um, that I did about the film. We had obviously a different take in many ways, but like one thing was the uh, Gnostic element, of course, in the film. And then, of course, Jay's going to do his Barbieheimer analysis tomorrow night. Again, I would have done that tonight, but um, I could not get a, a ticket. To see the film, there was not a single ticket, so I'm going to try and go tomorrow again. Um, but I will have my own um, uh, Toppenheimer, Sloppenheimer analysis soon on the way. Uh, yes, and oh yeah, he also talked about it on the fourth hour of uh, AJIW, and um, it, it's crazy what those films are doing in terms of um, the culture right now. I mean, they're really, they really are big, very big movies. They're, they're both big. And I think it's interesting, the dichotomy um, in terms of what they represent in, I guess, what, the culture war or something. Um, Oppenheimer, you know, is the, the priests of, of scientism, uh, literally depopping de cities. Um, and... Barbie is uh, people as 
people as Pinocchio objects trying to escape the Gnostic uh, prison planet. Um, and, and, and actually having their own perfect world like they wanted it and then, and then leaving on purpose, which is, which is odd. Right. Yeah. I think they're both, um, they're both essentially, uh, existentialist, um, existentialist, like, I don't know, parables or something, right? They're both about like crossing the abyss or staring into the abyss. There's your abyss word, um, which is very, very strange because they, they also have, especially Barbie has this veneer of brightness. Um, and there are things to, obviously you can still enjoy the movies, um, but I just, I think that's odd. And then of course the Wes Anderson movie, which comes out, which is like, the perfect mix. It's like the nexus point between those two movies because it's about the nuclear age and also about like the stylized fifties, uh, nostalgic fashion. So it's like, that's right in the middle. That's very odd. Um, okay. So I'm just going to end it here. Uh, please, um, like, and share the stream. You guys, please, uh, think about supporting me. I can really, I can really use your support. Um, help me to buy books, help me to do all the things that I need to do, fix my audio. Um, I need to somehow figure out how to get, I'm a total boomer with this, so I don't know how to get Zoom on OBS. And I would like to be able to do that so that I don't have to go to StreamYard to have a guest on, right? Um, you have Baze Normie says, sometimes I miss Blockbuster. Man, I miss Blockbuster uh, big time. I, does, uh, do they still have that Twitter account, the last Blockbuster? That was a classic um, a while back. That one and Arby's Nihilist. Remember that one? That one was good. Whoever writes those are... Speaking of Nihilist uh, existentialism, right? The, the Nihilist to Arby's is pretty good. So please, yeah, think about supporting me, you guys. Um, uh, like and share the streams. Um, please uh, look at my Shakespearean stream. I know it's pretty uh, niche, I guess. But we've done a lot of Shakespeare on this channel, you know, I've done like 20 Shakespeare streams and, you know, I, you don't have to have read the play, um, to, to, uh, you know, enjoy or appreciate the analysis for one thing. Right. Um, also, hold on. also I got a bunch of stuff coming up and we've got the Oppenheimer stream coming up soon after I watch the film, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, please see the links, you guys. Um, please think about supporting me. I hope everybody's having a great, a great Saturday night. I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me here after after dark. After dark, you heard that Drake song? After dark, uh, Skinamax. After dark, with all the bathed lit breathalyzers and the BLA Barbies, the blar the Blarbies, the BLA Barbies, the Blarbies. And the based breath, uh, breathalyzers. We're all here talking about high IQ literature, uh, assassination samurai films. Um, and yes, please check out my links there. Um, please think about supporting me. You can support me anytime. And I'm just going to finish up quickly here. Uh, I'm not going to do an extensive analysis of it, but I'm going to talk just for a second about this um yeah blarby <laughs> about um this book right here which i really enjoyed and it's called the prone gunman is by jean patrick manchette and i actually got this book because i wanted something completely different from what i've been reading um which is the all the dark material and the you know, heavy literature. I wanted something that was uh, a light, you know, a light novel, something, you know, just an adventure, a French, uh, you know, kind of crime novel about a, an assassin. And uh, it was, I mean, this is a New York Times notable book, it says on the front. Um, and actually, it's funny because it's published by City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco, of course. We've talked about City Lights and the Beats. Um, and I think that in itself is interesting because this is not the sort of work that they would normally um, publish, right? A book about um, 
assassinations, uh, mercenaries, uh, violence. You know, that's not exactly a uh, a City Lights type of book. They usually publish, you know, Jack Kerouac and um, and William Burroughs. Now that William Burroughs especially is has its own type of violence, but um, I just thought that was that's interesting that it was picked up like that. That's probably because uh, Mar- Maurice Gorodias, their uh, William Burroughs' publisher at Olympia Press in France, um, probably got this guy published by City Lights to uh, get him translated because he's a French writer. But this is a good book. It's about a guy. Um, let me read the first paragraph here because it's um, this is a hard boiled sort of you know like. It's compared to like Dashiell Hammett and all that kind of stuff. I don't really care about that. I I I like books about um political thrillers, right? I like uh, spy novels. You know, that's it's sort of light reading and it it just breezes by and it's a good one to pick up. Um, and it begins here. It says, uh, "It was winter, and it was dark." Great first sentence. It was winter and it was dark. Past tense, simple, right? Simple, very simple idea. But we get a lot of, uh, we we sort of, we get a mood just from that first sentence. Um, it was winter and it was dark. Coming down directly from the Arctic, a freezing wind rushed into the Irish Sea, swept through Liverpool, raced across the Cheshire Plain where the cats lowered their trembling ears at the sound of the roaring in the chimneys and through the lowered windows struck the eyes of the man sitting in the little Bedford van. The man did not blink. This is a hard-boiled book about a guy um, whose name is Terrier, and uh, he's a real dog of a man because this guy is on a mission to... um, He's a hired assassin, and he has to, you know, he goes up and he, he... he uh, eliminates th- this guy almost right away coming out of this pub. And we learned that um, it's at the behest of some sort of conglomerate, some sort of mo- multinational uh, conglomerate. And oftentimes, I think people forget that one of the major markets for assassination and murder is big business and corporations, right? You remember the movie... Um, uh, what's the movie? Uh, Traffic. Remember the movie Traffic with uh, Benicio del Toro. Uh, remember that the guy being assassinated by Frankie Flores in that movie is like he's a business guy. Even even in um, uh, No Country for Old Men, it's like the business guy hires Anton Sugar. He's a psychopathic killer. Yeah, you hired this guy. But he's a loose cannon, and if you don't watch out, you know, you're paying him, but there's no reason he couldn't come in here and just, you know, kill everybody in this place. It's basically what he's saying. And so it's interesting that these people, you know, this makes me think of it makes me think of one offshoot of the Smedley Butler story, right? Which is that um the military, you know, specifically like the Marines are just hitmen and and hard men. Uh, heavies protecting the international conglomerates and the and the corporations abroad. Right, we set up an oil rig. Um, there's an oil field in in Iraq. Um, it keeps being attacked by these pesky locals who don't like it there. So we got to send in some you know security. Then we got to ramp up the security, and we got to we got to send in some uh, you know ex legionnaires and some mercenaries. Then we got to ramp it up and have a full scale. Uh, you know, Marine garrison, and then that turns into turns into a full scale invasion that lasts twenty years, right? Um, yeah, the red drink is uh, it's pretty good. It's like I don't know, it's just some sort of basic soda with like lemonade, soda, some sort of basic soda, some sort of pop, some sort of pop, some sort of commie pop, eh? Do people really say pop anywhere? Um, I bet Michiganders say pop. Um, I don't even say soda because I'm from the South. I only said it in that sentence so that y'all would know what I was talking about. But usually down here, Jethro, ain't that right? Down here, we refer to every drink as Cokes. Everything's a Coke. Give me a Coke. 
Um, so uh, what happens is uh, this dude, he has to take out some people. Then he meets with his handler. His handler's like, uh, you know, okay, good job. Now I got another job for you. And uh, Terrier says basically, nope, I'm out. That was my last job. So then he has to do, of course, one last job. Well, the one last job is, uh, of course, he's going to be eliminated during the job. But he sort of figures this out, and then he has to go after the people that had employed him. And also, they they uh, kill his uh, love interest, and then he has to go rescue this other woman. You know, he's a... So that's basically what the plot of the book is. But um, it's pretty good because um, some elements in it are pretty revelatory. Like, for example, on uh, pages 84 and 85, um, when they have kidnapped him, he mentions, the protagonist himself, he mentions that he has a dead man switch. That if they take him out, then he's got an insurance policy, will, which will uh, allow, of course, the newspapers are going to publish the whole story, man. Um, and he doesn't say that in the book. It's not that cheap. He actually just kind of alludes to that somebody has some sort of blackmail information on his, on his uh, employers, which I thought was pretty uh, subtle and well done. Um, uh, what else? There's a whole section, the section on when he is actually the prone gunman of the title is pretty interesting because it, it details his, um, you know, his, his behavioral actions as a sniper. And we see that in the, we see that in film, we see that in the movie Sniper, we see it in uh, Sean Penn's The Gunman, which again is based on this book. It's, that one's different. Um, in that film, the main character is in the uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and he has to assassinate some oil guy and then get out of Dodge. And of course, his, his guys that he works with then rise up the ranks while he's in exile, and one of them is Mark Rylance. Uh, Mark Rylance is a great stage actor. He went to my drama school. Um, but he then runs like this huge mercenary outfit, and then they are set on eliminating Sean Penn because they got to tie up loose ends. Uh, that movie also has Ray Winstone, and Ray. I like Ray Winstone. He's a Ray Winstone, right, boss? I'm, I'm Ray. I am Ripper, Slasher, Wolf. <laughs> He's good in. What's the movie with Ben Kingsley, and Ray Winstone? Yes, 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 yes. No, yes, yes. Where he's got the swimming pool and they're in like they're in Spain, and Ben Kingsley is like the psychopathic gangster. What's that movie called? Ben Kingsley, Ray Winstone. That's a great movie. Well done movie. That's also like a sexy beast. Thank you, Jethro. Yeah, that's also like almost a David Mamet um, type of film. Ray Winstone's cool because my friend Steph is best friends with Ray Winstone's daughter. Ain't that wild? Ain't that wild? Yeah, Ray Winstone played uh, Henry VIII. He was perfect for that role. I've been trying to get a copy of that uh, for a while, and I can't. I can't get it. Um, was that Wolf Hall? Was that the one that was called Wolf Hall? I'm not sure if that was it, but yeah, he is perfect for that role. Um, all right, so let's finish this up. Um, Anyway, so if you're looking for a, uh, I'm not like, I don't usually recommend books like this, but if you are looking for a sort of easy read, normal, you know, it's not too complex, not too deep, and it, it doesn't have to dive into all the dark stuff that, it, you know, we usually go into a uh, type of book, you know, read a book that's like this, just go explore, right? This is, um, again, Jean-Patrick uh, Manchette, he's a, he's a French writer. Um, kind of, you know, it's pretty cool. And um, it's called The Prone. There's a whole series of these books it's called The Prone Gunman. A lot of people revert to, you know, they like reading like uh, fantasy novels or, you know, sci-fi. And that's cool, too. I think that's, you know, I think that's cool. I don't really, um, that's not my bag, baby. But um, I like sort of military and spy stuff. In fact, I, I like just reading history and nonfiction. But, um. But, you know, sometimes it's good to get away from the stuff, right? 
Okay, let's see. Do we have any support tonight? Do we have any support? Anybody drop any quid? Let's check. All right, well, there's nothing in the dono chat. Right, I dropped the link somewhere. Okay, there's nothing there. Let's look at uh, this other one. Yo, where's my super chat page? Let's look at the super chat page here. Uh, navigating this stuff always makes me nervous um, because I'm always afraid I'm going to hit that X. Uh, let's see. What's today? Right, okay. Well, that's all right. That's all right. No super chats tonight, but you guys were very, you y'all were very um, generous before in those other ones. And uh, let's see. Lastly, I mean, I would go see Oppenheimer now if there was a late show, just so I could go see it. Um, yo, like shouts out to our our friend out there, our loyal friend uh, Jason, who drops an eight dollar PayPal super chat for me. Thank you so much for that Saturday night support. Really appreciate you, buddy. That means a lot. You know, reaching out like that. That is great. Thank you so much. Um, listen, y'all. Um. Please leave me some comments. Uh, let me know what you want to see covered. I've had a lot of great suggestions. Um, I'm, I am going to be covering, probably not soon, but uh, I will be covering. Oh, look at that. Thank you to DJ out there, our friend Dejire, who says, love Ronan. Awesome. He drops uh, $7.99 uh, Oz bucks. Thank you so much, DJ. Really appreciate it. Um, let's see. Uh, Cronosa says, uh, Sloppenheimer is freaking three hours long, though. Uh, yeah, I know, for real. But I don't have a problem with watching a long movie. Um, but ordinarily, I would say, if this were any other movie, I would go, look, man, these, this has got to stop. This is like getting to the point of these people are so self-indulgent. You know, they make a, a some BS movie that's three hours. All the movies are long now. So they need to... Also, the streaming services, by the way, the whole point of the streaming services is um, to make a 10-hour long movie, right? It's just a movie extended over 10 or 12 episodes, and that's why most of it is like fluff, right? There's so many red herrings in the in the narratives and stuff. I mean, not at the beginning of it, not at the when we had like a kind of a, a golden age of, you know, streaming like content, which was we had True Detective and uh, True Detective, Stranger Things, um, what else? House of Cards, season one was great. Um, you know, and you would expect uh, the Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer film to be um, super long because, you know, it's a long, complex story. Honestly, I don't really care about, like, the, you know, oh, he was... They were, you know, the, he was a communist and they were hard. Like, I don't care about his backstory. Like, I know I'm going to have to to see the film. Um, but I care about the the overall thing that happened. I don't really care about, like, his own uh, story. Nick Mullen, um, who is probably the greatest living comedian, makes a good point of saying that, you know, his whole Bhagavad Gita quote, um, it's like, he's so right with this. He's like, you can imagine that he knew he was going to have to make a statement and he was like, Oh man, what can I come up with? Why don't I pick uh, you know, not something normal. I'll pick something obscure, right? How about the Bhagavad Gita? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm a smart guy. Oh man, this is going to be a killer tweet. Right. And then he says it and then he's like, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> um, also I was saying to my friends in our, in our uh, thread earlier today that it's funny that, one of the other really famous quotes of the 20th century, um, the Neil Armstrong quote, is, is actually uh, a misquote and is illogical, right? If you've, th if you've thought about this before, then, you know, forgive me for bringing it up, but, uh, you know, no, but when he said it, he was like, this is from the Bhagavad Gita. And they were like, the what? Wow, that sounds smart. Is it from another country? It's an ancient it's Sanskrit? Whoa. That's, you know, whoa. 
<laughs> Chris says the Gita. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Neil Armstrong quote, right? Because he says, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, which sound, you know, it has, it pops, right? It's, it's lyrical, but it actually doesn't make sense, right? Because the, the quote was actually, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Because if you say one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, well, man and mankind are synonymous. They mean the same thing. They both mean mankind. So it has to be, a man, like a person, but it got lost in the, uh, it got lost in the uh, live simulcast from um, Moonbase Thirty Three over at um, Warner Brothers Studios, and uh, and they were like, oh, fuck it, it sounds good, right? But it doesn't make sense. But it's a cool sounding quote, I guess. Um, I think a better quote would be, uh. In Oppenheimer, when the when the nuke goes, I've already said this joke before, but when the nuke goes off and the explosion happens, that you hear a "Did I do that?" <laughs> because Urkel is on the team of scientists who create the <laughs> create the atomic bomb. It makes sense that he would be right. He's a smart guy. He's into science. Why wouldn't he be part of the team? He just made a big mistake. Um, yo, shouts out to uh, our friend Ryan out there who sent um, 233 for not entirely related, but any thoughts on any thoughts on what's what's what is this? What's what is this? What's that word? I'm not. Listen, man, I just learned how to read. I don't know what Pavis is. What's Pavis? What's Pavisi? P-A-V. What is that? P-A-V-E-S-E. What what that is? Somebody tell me what that is. What is thoughts on Pavisi? What's that? Thank you for the super chat, sir. Obviously, I don't have any thoughts on it because, you know, I'm a dumb dumb and I don't even know what that word is. You talking about uh, my man Pavel? Um, uh, Oppenheimer's sequel is about the Oppenheimer's sequel What's Pavici? What's Pavici? What is that? The opera? Building his transformation chamber. Yeah, he goes into the metaverse, and uh, I keep hearing all this stuff about Heisenberg. Um, I don't know the Italian writer Pavici. I don't know him. Um, the only uh, modern Italian writer I can think of is is, is that guy Dario Fo who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, who is a member of the Communist Party, and he's a playwright. And he won in, um, what, 1998? And I remember when that happened, because it was like, what? What is this? Um, one of the books I'm going to cover coming up soon, not soon, but I'm going to cover in the future, will be uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, because I'm going to be doing a Southern Gothic series, or Southern Gothic stream, or series, um, and Cesare Pavese, I don't, I don't know him. Um, and so I'll be doing uh, Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner. Um, what else? Uh, a couple other ones. And so I thought I would, I would just, you know, I might as well uh, cover this book because one reason is because the film is so bad. I really hate this film. You know, it's a Clint Eastwood film, and the whole film. First of all. Kevin Spacey is in it, and Jude Law plays the, you know, uh, a a young uh, a young fella, let's say. And this is an example of like where I didn't see this back in the day, but if I had, I'd be like, and I didn't know anything about Kevin Spacey, I'd go, oh, there's a question about this guy because he plays like a, you know, an architectural art dealer, uh, you know, bon vivant. Listen, we're here in Savannah, and uh, I know you're a Rolling Stone reporter coming to uh, talk about my house, John Cusack, but one never drinks a Tom Collins at night in Savannah. One never wears, one never wears a do, uh, pop ciders in Savannah at night. It's like, dude, stop telling me the rules, okay? I'm a grown man. I can do what I want. It's, it's really off-putting. 
but I get it because, you know, they're trying to, it's Southern Gothic and they're, you know, all this stuff. Um, but that also makes me, uh, somebody told me today that whenever I, I hear, whenever I hear he was just acquitted, of course he was. Well, he's a stunning and brave uh, citizen, and those were uh, false allegations, obviously. Um, but whenever I hear uh, anything about Kevin Spacey, I think of his role in House of Cards, where he's like, I, you know, I, will, I went to military school at the Citadel in South Carolina, and then that makes me think of Lindsey Graham. And somebody told me today that Lindsey, is this true? Lindsey Graham's, um, his aides, his political aides, he refers to them as his, he refers to them as his ladybugs. Is that true? Come on now, y'all, ladybugs. We need to have a meeting. Y'all need to write this speech for me, little ladybugs. Is that true? That can't be true. Somebody, somebody look that up and see if that's true. That sounds like it would be true. My, my ladybugs wrote this speech. So anyway, I'm going to cover this, and I'm going to cover the film, which is pretty terrible. Um, and, uh, also of course, Boccaccio and the Decameron. I got a bunch of stuff to cover, um, for the future. So, uh, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you for, um, for supporting me. Thanks for hanging out here on this, uh, late night after dark, uh, stream. And, um, you know, I hope everybody, yeah, usual suspects. What do y'all think of the usual suspects? I mean, I like it as a film. Um, and I think it's a shame that, like, Benicio gets such a small role. It's a it's a small but important role that he plays. You know, he plays it very well. It's, it's subtle, the way he does it. Um, Benicio is, like, is so good. You know, remember he was, um, he was the henchman in License to Kill. He's great in Basquiat. One movie I bet nobody in here has seen from Benicio is this movie, uh, Things We Lost in the Fire, which came out in 2007. And it is uh, Holly Berry and Benicio. And uh, it's a, it was a small movie, but um, I just happened to go see it in the theater, and I was blown away. I thought it was just wonderful. Um, but, yeah, I think The Usual Suspects is, is, a, is a great movie. Um, I particularly like uh, what's his name, um, Kobayashi, or Pete Postlewaite, because again, there's another guy who went to my drama school, and I met him twice, um, and he was given sort of a he he had his 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 uh, his professional career was revitalized by his friend Daniel Day Lewis, who um, got him cast as his father in the movie In the Name of the Father, um, which is a great film, and also remember he was great in. Uh, Romeo and Juliet with Leo. Benedicti Day. Great, great actor. I met him twice. Once in Oxford, um, where he was doing a tour of a, like, of Scaramouche or something. He was playing a sad clown, and I met him in the bar. He was wasted. And then the other time was at a cocktail party um, at drama school after graduation. Great guy. He's, he, uh, he's dead now. He died. His, one of his great final roles was as the villain in that movie, The Town, your mother, your mother was a, your mother, your mother was a junkie here. I clipped her. I clipped her wings. I clipped your father's nuts. I clipped those nuts. You're going to come back here. You're going to, I mean, he is vicious in that movie. He's good. Um, in the Name of the Father is a, also a, a great movie. Yeah, uh, Jethro says, Usual Suspects was written by McQuarrie. Isn't that Tom Coombs' friend? Yeah, that's that's Tom Coombs' friend who has those glasses and that he wears a scarf, a little muffler. Um, he yeah, and he does the uh, Mission Impossible movies. It's weird how um, the Mission Impossible film, you know, is uh, pretty much tanking um, in the cinema. L I mean, luckily, it didn't come out at the same time as these other two movies, and and Indiana Jones also same. I mean, it's got to be the worst performing of the Indiana Jones movies. Um, and what's interesting about it is that, uh, that Tom Coombe, who is the greatest Hollywood person of all time. And, um, you know, 
I love Tom Coon because he's just about movies. He wants to make movies and he wants to just make people happy and, go, and entertain them and go to the movies. I love that. Um, and his whole life is about making movies. I think that's cool. He's, he's dedicated to his thing. That's great. But the thing that he did with Oppenheimer and Barbie is interesting because you never see other actors do that in terms of their uh, promo tours. You just never see that, right? They asked him, what are you going to go see? And he's like, I'm going to go see Barbie, then I'm going to go see Oppenheimer. And he said it a number of times. I mean, he was promoting the movies. And the point is that he can do that because, like, he's, you know, he, he like, is so vital to the Hollywood industry. I mean, look at what Top Gun did while everything else was trash and everything else was shut down, you know, it, like that movie, the income from that movie, the, the proceeds will fund a whole, you know, a whole bunch of other films that are smaller. So kind of like, you know, Taylor Swift or Beyonce on tour or putting out albums like those two artists allow for all of these other people to make music because no one else ever makes any money. Right. Um, but you know, it's funny that they're not doing so well in the cinema, but I'm surprised that anything does well in the cinema anymore because Hollywood is, you know, I mean, it is what it is. Right. All right, Sean, that's about all I got. I think I'm, I think I'm about beat. Um, thank you so much for being here. Please go and check out my latest uh, appearance on Boiler Room. I was just on Boiler Room on Thursday night with our friends Hesher and Grunt and um, Ruckus and all that, and Spore. And, uh, you know, we did it like three hours on current events, and we do, do a deep dive into all that stuff, so that was cool. Also, check out my appearances on TNT Radio Live with Lynn, State of the Nation, and Hesher, and also... Um, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcast, the late night Saturday show with Joseph Arthur. I did the whole first hour uh, with him, so that's pretty cool. If you want to see me on somebody else's channel, my friend Mick um, reached out and uh, you know put my name in there in a couple of other big channels. If you want to see me um, on somebody else's channel, you know, let him know. Also, please reach out to my friend uh, Rooks G out there who um, makes the music that we use for. Our streams, he just put out a new EP called Cyber Liminal, which, you know, is awesome drum and bass breaks um, jungle. So please reach out to him, subscribe to his channel. And uh, I think that's about it. If you want to support me, you can do that anytime by going to the video description. You can also uh, follow me on Instagram. And um, if you want to see me cover anything, please leave it in the comments. And I've, I know I've got a bunch of sponsored streams I got to cover coming up. And I haven't forgotten any of them. I'm just trying to uh, fit them in. Sometimes it's difficult just to get the books. Um, and so, again, please keep supporting me so that I can do that. Um, Spellborg. Baze Normie says, Spellborg. You want me to cover a, a Spellborg film? So what would be a good Spielberg movie to do that hasn't been covered? Uh... Probably Poltergeist 2, but that might be too much in terms of the toss because it's so dark. Carol Ann! Carol Ann! God, that movie is there. Oh, one more thing before I go. I did watch the film um, The Pope's Exorcist today with uh, Russell Crowe. And, you know, following on the heels of Nefarious, same sort of theme. And uh, I, I was, you know, I thought it was going to be terrible, but it's actually, for the most part, not a bad film. It was pretty entertaining. And Russell Crowe um, is great in the movie because, for one, I forgot that I was watching Russell Crowe. He really disappears into this role. He plays, you know, an Italian uh, exorcist priest. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought it was pretty well done. So, um, you know, it was an entertaining film. You might want to check that out. Uh, Anyway, that's about all I got, y'all. So I'm going to leave it at that. And to play us out, here's Rooks G and uh, cut off his new EP, Cyber Liminal. Thanks, y'all. Here is Pitfalls. Let's go. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. All right, y'all. Have a good Saturday night.
you get how it's called Leninade and then the drink is red? <laughs> Good marketing, I guess. Okay. Tell me them damn aliens. 